Okay, just a little story to get started. So last night, I wake up at 12.30 and I'm just awake. And went to bed about 9, 9.30. And so I get up and I do some stuff and, and then the last thing I remember is 1.45. Well then at 2.15 my phone goes off. My phone goes off. And so I look at it and it's your beloved pastor. And, and so I say, hello? And he says, oh, Chuck, I'm glad I caught you. <laughs> so where do you think I would be? And, and he says, well, I, I just, what time is it? I said, he, he, I said, what time do you think it is? And he says, 8.15. I said, no, it's 2.15. And then he starts laughing. He, he starts laughing. And I said, do you know how much I hate you right now? <laughs> And then, and then he says, oh, I forgot to tell you, in the morning, you got to be there at 9 o'clock to, the to teach the teachers before you do your regular service. And I said, so you call me at 2.15 to tell me I have to get up an hour earlier. <laughs> and he's still laughing. <laughs> anyway, they're having a good time, and they said to say hi to all of you guys, and they miss you. So anyway, we miss them too. So... My topic is Mary, a call to provide. And so, just as a way of intro, as Mary provided a place for Jesus to dwell, in a sense, within her and be born, we're going to look at her life as sort of a template because we're to have Christ in us and allow him to work his way out through our lives, the way we live. Colossians 1.27 says, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. So we're going to look at five things this morning. And so number one is meeting Mary. Number one. Number one. <laughs> Elsie, I'm going to harass. Oh, it's Jamie. Oh, I'll, I'll treat you much better. <laughs> Elsie, I saw you born. I was there when you were born, so. Okay, meeting Mary. So, in your mind, I don't need an answer or anything. When do you think, where in the Bible are we first introduced to Mary? Think about that just for a second, just for a couple seconds. Where are we first introduced to Mary? It may not be where you think. It's actually in Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your heel, and you shall bruise his head. He wasn't talking about Eve. He was talking about the woman that would bear the Messiah that would bring the Messiah to us. We also read about her in Psalm 22, verses 9 and 10. But you are he who took, out of, took me out of the womb. You made me trust when I was on my mother's breasts. I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You have been my God. So again, Mary, this was the messianic psalm in which Jesus cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me to take them back to this psalm? Again, talking about Mary. Isaiah 7, 14, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. And there's other places actually in, in Isaiah that refer, they're messianic chapters and they refer to the mother. And, and so there's references to Mary all the way through. Now my point being is that he knew her from the foundation of the world. He knew her before she was ever born. He, he had a plan for her life. He had a way of working through her that would allow her to know him. And it was designed specifically a life just for her. And in this respect, we're really no different. He, he knew us from the foundation of the world, and he's designed an environment for you to grow up in, to live in, in which if you provide a place for Jesus to dwell, you will be, become like him, you will know him and experience what he has called us to in abundant life. Now, God did this for Mary as he does for us and he will treat us accordingly. And when you provide that place for Jesus to dwell, he's free to work. 
He's free to work in your life. He's free to minister to you, to change you. But there's something that has to happen. There needs to be that provision. We have to provide our responsibility. Matthew 18, 3. Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless there's conversion that takes place, unless we come to the place where we see Jesus as truth and turn away from all of the, the worldview we had before, the lifestyle of selfishness, the lifestyle that this world promotes, and turn and turn to trust in Him and live for Him and be converted, we won't be able to provide a place for Him to grow in us. But then He does His work. John 3.3, 3, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. When you convert, when you turn to him, when you trust in him to forgive sin and trust him as the Lord that will lead your life, he creates within you a new spirit, a new creation. You become new. All things are new in Christ Jesus. You become a new creation in which he can work. And he's going to work in your life uniquely, uniquely from everyone else. It's never the same. God works so completely different. It's like raising your children. My, my middle daughter has four boys, and they treat them, they have to treat them all differently. The other day, they were doing chores, and and. Kurt and Anna were, you know, kind of just going around, okay, you got to do this, you got to do that. And the third one down, finally, he just starts going, oh no, and he just plops on the couch. And she looks at him, and he's known as the drama queen in, 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 in the family. So she says, what's the matter, what's the matter? And he goes, all the demands you put on us. <laughs> <laughs> and so they treat him uniquely, differently. All of the kids they do, but it's the same with the Lord, just as we do with our kids. Look at when Lazarus died. Martha and Mary said exactly the same thing to him. Why weren't you here? And in the case with Martha, he gives her a doctrinal statement. I'm the resurrection of life. He who believes in me shall never die. Mary says the same thing, and what does he do? He weeps with her. He weeps with her. Look at the resurrection. Look at how differently he treated people. When Peter sees him, what happens? He, he has him eat with him, and then he asks him three questions about, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times, just to give Peter the chance to be forgiven for the three denials. When, when he meets Thomas, Thomas says, I just want to touch you. And, and, and he just said, here, touch my side, touch my hands. It's me. And, and, and then with Mary, remember Mary Magdalene when he's risen from the dead. She thinks it's the gardener and she's wondering where he is. What have they done with his body? And all of a sudden she says, or he says to her, Mary. And she just freaks and grabs onto him and clings to him with a death hold. I've lost you once and I'm never going to lose you again. And he says, Mary, you got to let me go. You got to let me go so that I can ascend and send the Holy Spirit. He treated them all differently. He'll treat you in such a unique way. God has designed you. I love Jeremiah 29 where it says, I don't think evil thoughts about you. I, I, I think of you in ways of a future and a hope. He has designed you with a future and a hope eternal. And, and, and just as he treated Mary so uniquely, he'll treat every one of us uniquely. Number two, in chapter one of Luke, Verse 46 through 48. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. She rejoiced in her salvation. She looked where she came from. She didn't come from Jerusalem the metropolitan city. She came from a little podunk town called Nazareth. It, 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 would, it would be like a contrast would be if, if she was born in our day and age and in our area, instead of coming from Seattle, she would come from Roy. <laughs> what good thing could come out of Roy? <laughs> and so, again, it, that, that's the contrast. She, she, she was a woman, not a religious leader. She wasn't married to a priest or the high priest or someone that you would think of should bear the Messiah. 
Interesting. There's a group over in Israel, and it's a secret group. They're called the Druze. And they don't believe that God would allow a woman to birth the Messiah. So they think it's going to come from a man. And so they wear these big baggy, baggy pants so that if he happens to give birth and the baby comes from wherever it's going to come, it won't fall to the ground. It will land in one of the pouches. How bizarre is that? And how bizarre is it to even think that there's a man alive that could go through a pregnancy and then birth a child? That's even more bizarre in my mind. I've never met that man. (laughs) But she came with humility because she knew God showed her favor. And, and, And this is so important to understand that when she found favor, she understood what that meant. It was the same thing what it meant when he came to Noah, and Noah Noah found the favor of God. You could say it this way. They understood the grace of God. They understood the grace of God. She understood that that she didn't deserve this. She understood that she was, she, she didn't enter a competition. She didn't take a test. She didn't have to produce something. He chose her out of love, and it was by grace. She seemed to understand the implications of God saving her. He came to her. It was the angel coming to her, not her seeking this out. It was God coming to her just as God seeks us. He came to us. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord this morning, it's because God was seeking after you. And by grace, you turned to him. She was saved from sin, knowing that the living God would use her and is going to use her. I think the longer... You, the older you get, the more you realize it, it, it was all by grace. I look back at my life and the things that could have happened, the things that probably should have happened, and I realize surely goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. Mary understood this at a very young age. She was probably only 15, 16 at the time. What a precious, precious woman. The implications of salvation. She understood that she stood righteous before God. And there was a future and a hope for her. And and as we look ahead to this hope, this great hope, I, I just love the implications. No more pain. No more worry. No more fear. A new body that we might face, we might be with before God face to face. All your desires, all your longings fulfilled. How many of you just would love to be an artist and you've tried and you're a failure and you're lousy at it? Who do you think put that desire in your heart? Do you not think in heaven that somehow he's going to fulfill that? I mean, he puts these desires, and so much of it is for the future. It says in in Luke 10, 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. They just come back from this evangelistic outreach and and they could heal people. The the demons were subject to them. And he says, hey, that's not what you should be rejoicing in. That's not what your hope should be in. These things are great, but they're only for a period of time. What you should be rejoicing in is that your names are written in the book of life for all eternity. Rejoice because your name is written in heaven. I don't think there's any greater story. If you look at some of the greatest tales of all time, the greatest stories of all time, it all dealt with someone giving their life for someone else. There's no greater story than that. And, and one of the things, a guy was telling me the other day, he said that, you know, when the Harry Potter books first came out, I knew at the end Harry would have to die for his friends. And, and I'm not promoting the books or anything like that. I'm just saying that's the greatest story ever told. It appeals to every one of us that someone would give up that which is the most precious to them for the sake of others. And we keep coming back to the gospel, don't we? I'm what you would call retired now. I do a lot of stuff, but I'm really busy, but but I don't do this all the time anymore. Well, I do, but at other churches. I I just don't have the administration and all that kind of stuff. But but the thing is, I love Jesus more than I ever have in my life. And it all comes back to the gospel. I realize more and more what he's done for us. The older you get, the more you realize how sinful you are. You're just kind of a corrupt, old, grumpy old man. It's just the way it is. And he saved me and died for me. And I'm going to be in heaven with him someday. And I, I can't think about heaven too much. I get, I, seriously, I just, I can't wait. I can't wait to be in heaven. I, I just 
think of being with God and all the activity, all of the creativity, being with all of you guys and, and seeing in you in your, in your new bodies because you don't look so good right now. <laughs> and, and you'll see me in my new body and people that are, you know, I do the seniors and more of our friends are in heaven than are here with us now. And so we're looking forward to it. We want to be with them again. She rejoiced in her salvation. Number three, she was willing even though she didn't, she was willing to do this even though she didn't understand nor could she control things. She, she didn't understand or control things. So much of what happened to her she didn't understand or control. Luke 1, 34 and 38, then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? Let it be to me according to your word in verse 38. She didn't understand. It wasn't unbelief, but she's thinking, okay, I, I'm not married yet. Well, I am married. I'm betrothed. But I, 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 I'm not having relationships with a man. I've never had relationships with a man. How is this even going to be possible? And then she finally says, Lord, your, your will be done. I, I, I'm willing. I'll do it. But I don't know how it's going to happen. Much of her life was like that. Luke 2, 49 through 51 says, Why is it that you sought me? Do you not know that I must be about my father's business? But they did not understand the statement. But his mother kept all these things in her heart. So when he's about 12, they go down to one of the feasts. They all leave with family, heading back to Nazareth. And they find out about a day into the travel that Jesus isn't with them. They go back. They find him in the temple discussing spiritual matters with the religious leaders. And they're amazed at his wisdom. And they say, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why, why, why did you cause this scare in us? Why aren't you with us? And, and he says something like, didn't you know that I must be about my father's business? <laughs> Can you imagine? How, how, do you, how do you comprehend that? In John 2, verse 3 through 5, Mary said, they have no wine. And Jesus said, woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Mary said to the servants, whatever he says, you do it. All she did was ask if he could provide some wine for the party. <laughs> and he comes back with this response. I mean, woman, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. I mean, what is she to make of that? You see, so much of what she went through, she didn't understand. One of the reasons for that is this is the first person, Mary, who has actually encountered and had a relationship with an absolutely perfect human being. You see, we don't know what that is. We don't have a way of relating to that because everything we relate to in our relationships deals with, with flawed people, with sinful people, with people who are still maturing, some very immature, growing through life, and yet here for the first time is someone absolutely without sin, absolute perfection, and she has to deal with him as mother. Amazing. Amazing. Now, there are many things in your life you will not understand. You're not going to understand. Sometimes you're going to look at God and go, what are you thinking? And, and, and it's just not going to make sense. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging. You won't be able to explain it to people around you. Yet, down deep, you know there's no place else you can go. John 6, 67 and 68, do you also want to go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. See, he was saying that they must eat his flesh and drink his blood if they're going to be a part of him. And they're just going, you've got to be kidding. This is just getting weirder and weirder. And that's when all of, uh, so many of his disciples left. And by the Romans, they were categorized as cannibal, cannibals because of this, these statements. But Jesus, of course, says, I'm talking according to the Spirit. But he asked them, are you guys going to leave too? And Peter just says, Lord, we have no idea what you're talking about right now but we know you have the words of truth and we're not going anywhere. You're going to have to say that sometimes. See, think about it for a minute. What kind of God would he, would he be if you understood everything about him? In reality, he would be a God of your own creation. You would have made him up. Some people say, oh, I just was ever God of love, you know. He just loves everybody, accepts everybody. You know, and that's God of your own creation. And, and the problem was that with this is, unless he is greater than you, he can't help you. 
because he's just a God of your own creation. He won't be able to transform you because you can't change yourself. If he's a God that's just an extension of yourself, one you've created, you can't change yourself, so how is he going to change you? He can't forgive you because you can't forgive yourself. I hear it all the time over the years. I just can't forgive myself. I just feel condemned about the things I've done. Well, how, how is that going to happen if he's not greater than you? He can't comfort you unless he is greater than your heart because there are times you're going to be condemned. You're going to face condemnation and it's going to be tumultuous and it's going to be tormenting. 1 John 3.20, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. You see, you need a God that is greater than you. You need a God who will tell you things that you don't want to hear because we are blind to so much of the sin in our life. And he graciously reveals that as time goes on. You need a God who will tell you you are loved and you're forgiven when you are condemning yourself and others around you are doing the same thing. Job understood this. Job understood that he had a God who loved him, even when all those around him were condemning him. 1 John 3.20 talks about, you know, the God, like I just said, that God is greater than our heart. Now, some will say, unless I get an airtight answer, I won't believe or trust God. Well, God's not going to give you airtight answers, but instead he gives you an airtight person, Jesus. That is our answer, him. You look at him coming and what he came to and, and what, he, what he went through. He suffered just like we would, even more so. We can't control things. Many are trying. There are many. I, I've met many people over there. They're trying to control their environment. But in the process, what they're really trying to do is control God. We're trying to control our environment and we're driving everybody else nuts. If we don't get our way, we're mad. If things don't go the way we want them to, there's all these undercurrents and people kind of walk on eggshells around you because they don't want to upset you. And so I have people like this in my family. And so we just kind of work around them and we just, you know, you, you don't want to mess things up and, and, and you manipulate for supposedly the good of others and the protection of others and the protection of themselves. Your, your, your intentions are good. You're controlling things around you because you want the best for everybody, and yet it makes life miserable for everybody. It, is, it isn't something that's a blessing. I'm so glad my daughter, who has my oldest grandson, isn't controlling. He, he's technically blind. It was funny. We were playing cards the other day, and 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 and. And Hammy, we had Hunter and, and Cole. Cole's the one that's technically blind. And so he made some more mis some mistake. And so Hammy says, what's the matter with you, Cole? Are you blind? Oh, yeah, you are. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I mean, they just, I mean, they just live in a different world over there. And, and, and they just, you know, they just take it in stride. That's just the way things are. But she lets him do stuff I would never let him do. And I'm, I'm looking at her and saying, what are you thinking? You, how can you let him do He'll be fine. He'll be fine. And I'm so glad she's that way because he will be a better person for it. He will do things he, people would say he would never. He's wrestling right now for heaven's sakes. And, and he was won four, four out of eight matches. He pinned people. I, I just, here's this blind kid out there. Just, you know, it's just amazing. So. But in this way, we try and control God. And as a result, when we're trying to control everything, we, we, we won't take risks with our finances. We, we won't allow changes to take place in our life. We're not going to go with the flow unless there's a fight, right? And, and that's what people like that do. As a result, when you're fighting with God, you never get to know his rest. You never get to know his peace. You never get to know his joy, his love, and his joy. You, you're always trying to control the environment. It's a tough way to live a Christian life. You see, to know God is a little like putting an elephant in your living room. The furniture's going to get moved. You, you know that, right? If you put an elephant in your living room, the furniture's going to get moved. It's just the way it goes. If a tornado lands, things are going to get rearranged. When you turn your life over to the living God, it's not going to go the way you think it should all the time. He's going to rearrange things. But, but the beauty is when you provide a place for him to grow in your life and to do these things, it's amazing how you can just experience more of an abundant life. 
She was willing. She didn't always choose to control or figure things out. She just trusted in circumstances. Instead of fighting circumstances, why not try asking God to change you or to, to allow you to show his love and his glory throughout the, the, the change and the circumstances that might be changing around you, to glorify him and to be a witness in those situations. Mary did just that. She didn't cry, try and control them. She realized things weren't going to go the way she always thought they would, and she was blessed because of it. Number four, she suffered but not alone. In Luke 2.35, it says, Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. There were many times she suffered. Many, many times she suffered. And, and some of them were emotional and some of them were, were just ways that we couldn't even imagine. She suffered the scorn of a small town where she was pregnant and not yet married. She was betrothed and that was like a marriage. You had to get a divorce it, 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 once you were betrothed, but you couldn't uh, consummate the marriage. And so everybody just assumed that she committed adultery. Everybody just assumed she, Jesus was an illegitimate child. And, and this would go on. Joseph wanting to put her away. Joseph, you know, saying, okay, I get it, but I love you. So let's go somewhere. Let's, let's get away from all of this. Jesus saying to, to his mother and brothers, at one point they thought he was just, they said beside himself, it just means crazy. They thought he had gone crazy. So Mary and the brothers and sisters all go and they, they, there's a huge crowd. So they sent someone up to say your brothers and, and your, your mother, your brothers and your sisters are here. And he says, who is my mother and brother and sisters? Those who do the will of God. I mean, just kind of a slam on, on, on Mary and, and, and the family. At the wedding, he rebukes her, in a sense. Woman, what do I have to do with you? Jesus, when on the cross, he looks at John and says, John, behold your mother, and mother, behold your son, John. And we think of that as a wonderful, wonderful situation where Jesus is taking care of his mother. But think about it just a little more. Why did he have to do that? She had sons and daughters. It's very, in my mind, I think that she was estranged from her family. At this point, they all thought he was just a whack job and, 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 and just crazy, and he was going to get himself killed. And so they didn't want to have anything to do with him, but Mary stuck by him. And so she had no family at the end, and so Jesus has to give her to John. So she's, in a sense, betrayed by her own family. She has to watch Jesus die, her own son the sword piercing her heart as well. But she was not alone in her life. She had Elizabeth when she was pregnant, her Aunt Elizabeth, who was too old to have children, and she was pregnant. <laughs> and when she goes there, she says, you know, Jesus, uh, the, the child, woman, I, blessed are you, he says, she says to Mary, and then she says, my child leaped for joy when, when you came into the room. Because, you know, that relationship... And knowing that she carried the Messiah, Elizabeth was a, a support to her, a strength to her. The other Marys that came along, that, that she was with as they followed Jesus, she had companions, she had friends. He gave her to John, so John took care of her for a while. And then in the book of Acts, that 120, waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Mary was there. Mary was there. You see, you're going to suffer in this life. It's a promise. It's a promise. Um, in this world, you will have tribulation, Jesus said. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And he says, peace I give to you, not as the world gives, but as I give. You know, one of those promises that... If you're, how many of you have promise books in your house that you read through? Any of you have those promise books and stuff? Okay, if you do, I bet that one isn't in there. <laughs> they don't want you reading that one. <laughs> In this world, you're going to have tribulation. <laughs> That's not there. But it is a promise. He doesn't lie to us. He doesn't pull punches. He deals with us the way we're supposed to be dealt with and, and uniquely, but he doesn't hide things from us. You're going to suffer in this life, but you'll never be alone if you provide a place for Christ to dwell. Why? 
because everywhere you go, you're going to meet brothers and sisters. I've been all over the world, and I'll tell you, even when you don't speak the language, you speak the language. You speak the language of Jesus. And when someone knows you're a follower of Jesus and they're a follower of Jesus, man, you can hug and, and, and you can worship together and you don't even have to know their language because you have a deeper language. And you'll always have the body and you'll always have the Holy Spirit. God does comfort us. Many of you have gone through things where you've, you've sensed his presence. Some of you have gone through things where no one can go. You know, when we talk about death, no matter how many people you have in that room around you, no one can do this for you or with you. It's something you have to do alone. It, it, it's something you face alone. And some of you, even sometimes when I talk to John about his cancer and stuff, there were times where there was nothing anybody could do. And it was just the Lord. It was just the Lord with him. And God does comfort. Psalm 46.1, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. I love uh, in 2 Corinthians um, when it talks about God as the God of comfort. In verses 3 and 4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And sometimes that comfort comes from comforting others. You know, over the years as a pastor, you, 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 learn to, you learn people's stories. And so there are people that have gone through things that I've never gone through. And so when, when, when someone comes to me and they say, Pastor, I'm going through this and this is going on. And I, I just, oh, it's been so hard. And I said, hey, can I call so-and-so and have them call you? And immediately there's this connection because they've gone through the same thing. No one else has experienced that. And, and, and so God comforts us through others. And we are comforted oftentimes by comforting others. Romans 15.5, Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Jesus Christ. And then finally, number five. Jesus gave birth. In Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Or, <laughs> Jesus gave birth. <laughs> Why don't you say something? What is wrong with you? <laughs> Good grief. I know. Tap. Where were you when I need you? Good grief. It is, it is, as you get older, you just, well, first of all, you're, you get a little more confused, but then secondly, you just don't care anymore. It's just, <laughs> the, people are always saying, oh, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. <laughs> One day I was, I was totally in the wrong scriptures uh, at our seniors group, and I was reading the whole wrong set of scriptures, and I was going on, and I'm thinking, I don't think this is right. I don't think, but I just continued, and then, I, and then we all started laughing, and I turned the right one, and then Gary Thomas says, hey, Chuck, the sad thing is I was tracking with you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, so. She gave birth. It says it right up there. Okay. She gave birth. And this is a story you've all hear, heard, and we, we just, I mean, how can we not love it? Chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. The birth of Jesus. What an amazing thing. How we are so blessed. The other night I was just thinking, 
I was thinking about God and I was thinking, what if he wasn't like what he says he is? How horrible that is. But how wonderful it is that he is who he says he is. I mean, it could have been a billion different ways, but it wasn't. We have this God that loves us and a God who is willing to be a part of our lives no matter how messy it is and how messed up it is. 2 Corinthians 9.15 Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. You know, there's nothing I love more than talking about Jesus, but I always feel like a failure when I do. Because how can you describe such a wonderful being in his love for you? He's gone through everything with me. I can tell him more. I can tell him everything. There's nothing I hide from him. I'm honest with him. I tell him more than I, I tell my wife, and I love my wife with all of my heart, too. But I tell him everything. And, and, and to know that kind of relationship, she gave birth, and he came forth, and his name was Emmanuel, God with us. Now, if you, like Mary, give provide that place for Christ to be in you, you're going to bear something too. Just like she bore the Messiah, we're going to bear something. In John 15, he tells us, he is the vine, we are the branches. If we abide in him and he abides in us, we will bear fruit, much fruit, and fruit that will remain. Something is going to happen inside of you as you develop this relationship, as you spend time in the Word, in prayer, in fellowship, talking about Him, praying to Him. This grows within you, and, and, and there's a byproduct to all of this. It's not something you can make happen. It's something that happens as a result of your relationship with Him. It's just like it, when you, the Proverbs tells us to walk with people that are much more godly than ourselves, so it rubs off on us in a sense. We see them as an example and they challenge us and they encourage us. I've had the privilege of walking with godly men for many, many years, and they're constantly challenging me, not because they say stuff, but because of the way they live. And, and I'm constantly challenged. And, but as a result, as we do this, as we look at Jesus and we, we develop that relationship, and believe me, it has to be developed. There is no good relationship that isn't developed. You have to spend time. You have to give effort. You have to be willing to hear. You have to be able to ask questions and willing to hear the answers, whether they're hard or not, from the Scriptures. And you have to be willing to let him speak to you. As that develops, the byproduct is going to be fruit. Fruit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Huh. Is there anything bad about that kind of person? Not one thing. Wouldn't you love to be that kind of person? And, and, and so it's, it's a byproduct of our relationship. We bear fruit. You, you don't look at this and say, oh, I, I just need to be more loving. I just need to be more joyful. I just need to be more at peace. Yeah, rots a rock with that. <laughs> you see, that's why I think it's a huge mistake to think of Jesus as an example to follow. And when anybody tells me that, I think, man, you're doomed. Who can follow him as an example? I mean, he's absolutely perfect. But what he's asked for us is to develop the relationship. And as we develop that relationship, he grows in us. And he starts to come out in ways we don't even see. We're not always even aware of. And you're not the same person you were 10 years ago. You're not perfect. Because I know most of you, and you're... You're pretty bad, actually, but, but no, you know what I mean. You're not the same person. You, you've grown in some areas, and, 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 and sometimes you don't even always see it. Sometimes it just happens, and other people will say something. Hey, you know, you, you just, yeah, I kind of like you more <laughs> than I used to, you know? And, and it's just God working. You will bear fruit. And so as we head towards Christmas, Mary was a person who provided a place for Jesus to abide. Have you allowed for that? 
If you haven't, you can turn your life to him. Even as we just pray this morning, you can turn your life over to him. You can just give yourself to him as Lord and say, dwell in me. Let me turn to you. Help me, Lord. He responds to that so well and so completely. Let's, let's stand for a <laughs> I had planned on going longer. See, that's the difference between me and John. He plans on going shorter. I, I plan on going longer. So I, I, what time is your lunch? <laughs> it's probably not ready, and they're going to be upset at me. Um, and then Rachel's not here to do worship. So what time is the lunch today? Do you know what time it is? What time does it say in the, it's just right after the service? Oh, they've got to be ready then. OK, let's pray. <laughs> Lord, we are truly thankful for our time together. We are truly thankful for people that have gone before us, the cloud of witnesses, and Mary is one of them. She is a precious, precious lady, and we are thankful that she was willing and that you used her. And thank you that we can relate to a lot of things she went through. And normal Christianity is not always a perfect thing like we think. It, it is messy. It, it is sometimes we don't understand. We don't have control. And yet we know that we can turn to you at any time and you're right there. We thank you for that. May we walk as though you're with us every second of the day. Lord, thank you for dying for us. Thank you for giving us a righteous standing before the Father. And we long to be with you. We are so looking forward to your return. And we just offer this morning up to you in Jesus' name. Amen.